Hello, hello everybody. This is your first video for Unit 7, Section 2, all about hypothesis tests. This video is going to cover the basics of hypothesis tests, how to write hypotheses, uh, things like that. So this video is going to be a little bit longer, maybe than some of the others in this section, uh, but the the others will, will be uh, a little bit more bite-sized uh, and talk to you about uh, slightly smaller topics, right? This is a, an overview. So this one's going to take a little bit longer to get through. Okay. So let's go ahead and jump right into it here. So in the previous section, we learned about confidence intervals, which we use when we don't know a true value, right? And we want to come up with a, an interval of plausible values of that, that true population value, whether it's a proportion or a mean. Okay. Hypothesis tests are a little bit different, right? So we use hypothesis tests when someone has a claim as to what the truth is, right? Or what the true value is. And we want to essentially verify their claim or, uh, or say we don't have enough evidence to, to, to verify their claim, right? Um, these are sometimes called significance tests, uh, but we most of the time call them hypothesis tests in, in statistics, right? Uh, so the goal of hypothesis tests overall is always to evaluate the validity of a claim. It's very similar to what you would do in, uh, in a science class when you're designing an experiment, right? You start with a hypothesis and you develop an experiment in order to test your hypothesis. And then you have your results at the end that either verify the hypothesis you made at the beginning, or the, the results don't verify your hypothesis, which means that you have to reevaluate your initial claim. Okay, so we're essentially doing that just using mathematics and statistics and probability. Okay, so the formal definition of a hypothesis test is it's a formal procedure for using observed data to decide between two competing claims. Okay, and those claims are your hypotheses. Okay, so claims are statements that are made about a true value right? Like a population proportion or a population mean, right? And then we use statistics, right? Like a sample mean or a sample proportion in order to evaluate their claim. What you're going to see throughout the process of doing hypothesis tests is a lot of it is very similar to what we did with sampling distributions, where we would take a result that we got a statistic from a sample and say, okay, how likely is it that we get a sample value this extreme or more extreme, right? And then we would use that to evaluate um, or answer questions about, do we think that the, the value that they stated is as the true value is actually the true value, okay? But claims, right, your hypotheses are always made about a parameter. So either a population mean or a population proportion. For us in this unit, we're dealing mostly with proportions, right? This unit is about inference for proportions, okay? So there are a couple of types of hypotheses. There is a what is called a null hypothesis and an alternate, or sometimes it may be called alternative, right? I've written it both ways in your notes. It's They mean essentially the same thing, okay? Alternate, alternative, same thing, okay? So your null hypothesis is the claim you are trying to disprove, okay? Okay, it's like the status quo, okay, or it's what you are seeking evidence against. Okay, so when we do hypothesis tests, right, we're always starting with a claim that someone else made, and our goal as the statistician is to gather data in an attempt to disprove their claim, right? And if our evidence is not strong enough, then we are not able to disprove their claim. Okay, so the null hypothesis is your status quo, right? That's what you are trying to 
seek evidence against. Okay, the symbol, the symbol for the null hypothesis is a capital H and then it says zero down there. So H sub zero. Okay, uh, and the way that it's written is you would say H sub zero with a little colon, right? And then after that, you would have the parameter equals some value, right? So the parameter is either your population proportion or your population mean, right? And like I said previously, right, in this unit, we're dealing with the population proportion, right? So it wouldn't be, it's not your statistic value. It's not P hat that would show up here, but it's P, okay, right? The other type of hypothesis is called your alternate or alternative hypothesis, okay, which is the claim that we are trying to find evidence for. Okay, so this is our guess, right? We're coming at this from the perspective of, okay, we have this claim, we think that the claim is false, so we're going to propose this alternative hypothesis as to what we think the actual truth is, right? The actual true value is. And it's our job as the statisticians to attempt to prove our alternative hypothesis, right? Otherwise, we are going to, putting on my high school musical hat here, we're gonna stick with the status quo, right? Which is your null hypothesis. I cannot believe I just did that in a video. Wow, okay, so uh, alternative hypotheses can take multiple different forms, okay? The general symbol for an alternative or an alternate hypothesis is H sub A, okay? And it can take a couple of different forms, okay? So I have to write all of these out here, okay? So we can either, we can either make the claim that the parameter, the actual true parameter, is less than the value that was stated by our null hypothesis. We can claim that the parameter is actually greater than the value that was presented to us, or we could claim just that the parameter is not equal to. Oh dear, one second y'all, my thing zoomed in without me meaning to here. So I don't have a not equal symbol here, so I'm gonna have to, to draw it in, okay? So those are the three possible routes we could take, okay? You're gonna hear me talk about this a little bit more like later in this video, but these first two claims right here are for what we call one-sided tests. Okay, and then this claim, the not equal to claim, is for two-sided tests. Okay, and I'll get into what that is here in just a second. Okay, right? So one-sided versus two-sided, okay? A one-sided test has your alternative hypothesis stated with either a greater than symbol or a less than symbol, okay? In the actual problem, right, like in the statistics problem, it'll indicate uh, that you're talking about an increase or it'll say the word like larger and that would be for the greater than option, okay? Or it'll indicate a decrease or it'll say smaller or less, Right, and that indicates your less than option, okay? A two-sided test is when your alternative hypothesis is stated with the not equals sign, okay? So all the problem will indicate is that we have a difference or a change, okay? And they won't, they won't indicate one way or the other. They won't say like it must be less than or must be greater. We're just saying we think you're just wrong. We don't know what direction the actual truth would go, like if it's less or greater than what you're saying, but we just think it's different, 
Okay, so just a change. Right? Okay, so after talking about all of this, you're probably like, okay, great, what's the point? <laughs> okay, so why do we do these hypothesis tests? What's the point of them? Right, what do we use them for? Okay, so this is a very powerful statistical tool. Okay, what hypothesis tests do, the mathematical process of running a hypothesis test gives us evidence. If I could spell, that would be awesome. Against a null hypothesis in favor of an alternative hypothesis. Okay. Right? So it's essentially allowing us to say your claim, right, or your status quo is incorrect. And in reality, our alternative, all, our alternative hypothesis is actually true. Okay, the, you'll often hear me equate it to the idea of innocent until proven guilty. Which, as a phrase, has its own problems, uh, especially with the way that some court systems run, but that's neither here nor there. <laughs> okay, uh, that, but the, the, the phrase itself and the idea of the phrase like still stands, right? So typically in a court setting, right, if you go to trial, you are assumed innocent until you are proven guilty, right? So your innocence, right, the assumption is like your null hypothesis. Right. And if we want to show that someone is guilty, we have to prove it. Right. If we want to um, if we want to prove our our alternative hypothesis. Right. We have to provide enough evidence in order to convince people that our alternative hypothesis is true. Right. Uh, in a court. Right. That evidence can take many forms. But in a hypothesis test, that evidence takes the form of probabilities. Right. And how likely is this thing to occur? Right. OK, so essentially we are sticking to our status quo unless we have a strong enough reason to change our minds. OK, the overall question that we are attempting to answer when we run a hypothesis test is this. OK, how likely is it to get this particular result, this sample result? Right or your that sample statistic or even a more extreme result just by chance, right? Just by random chance, if the null hypothesis is true. OK, that is what we are trying to show and the question that we are trying to answer. OK, so whenever we run a hypothesis test, we go into it assuming that the null hypothesis is true. Right. And then we gather our data and we from our sample and we get a sample statistic. Right. And then we'll do something very similar to what we did with sampling distributions is we will use our knowledge of z-scores and normal distributions in order to calculate a probability, right? How likely is that particular sample result to occur, right? How likely is it? Um, again, under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. Right. So how likely is it that just because of the the natural like randomness present in the universe, right, that we would get this result? OK, if just because of the random nature nature of the universe, right, that that result is very unlikely. What that leads us to believe is that our underlying assumption was false. Right. That leads us to believe that our underlying assumption of our null hypothesis is false. Right. So that would provide us with enough evidence in order to say, actually, I think the our our null hypothesis is false. I think our 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 claim is is false. Um, and here's the evidence to support it. Right. So, like I said, the reason that we could have a sample statistic that's different from our 
our claim, right, the claimed true value is either, it's one of two things, either the null hypothesis is correct and the result occurred because of random sampling variability, right, the random nature of the universe, it's just a fluke value, okay, but the more likely scenario is that the alternative hypothesis is actually correct. And this weird result that we got, this extreme result that we got, is consistent with the actual true value of the population parameter, okay? So then the question becomes, well, what's the cutoff point, right? Like, how do I know when my result is extreme enough, right? How do I know that? Right. When will people be convinced? At what point will people be convinced that the null hypothesis is actually false? The claim is false. And my claim as the statistician, my alternative hypothesis is true. OK, and that's where this idea of P value comes into play here. OK, so what P value does is it helps us determine which of those two reasons that I listed above. Right. So either the the this idea is just this this result is just a fluke or this result helps us prove that the null hypothesis is false right uh your p-value helps you figure out which of those two reasons is actually happening in whatever scenario you are looking at right okay um so what it does right and what the definition of it uh, is. So the definition of p-value is p-value is a probability. So p-value is the probability that a given sample statistic okay, or a more extreme value would occur if the null hypothesis, so your claim, right? is true okay so it's essentially what it's like the answers the probability answers that you would give when you did sampling distribution problems okay that's essentially what your p-value is okay so what the p-value does right in in more layman's terms is it measures the strength of the evidence against your null hypothesis. Okay, and it answers the following question. It answers the question, how likely is this particular sample value to occur just by chance variation. Okay, so that's the question that we are trying to answer, right? And that's what the that's the question that the p-value helps us answer, right? So if we get a really small probability saying it's very unlikely that this would occur by chance variation, then that means it occurred for another reason. And that other reason is probably that our null hypothesis is actually false and our alternative hypothesis is true, okay? All right, so then the next question people typically ask me, okay, uh, is, well, what number, right? How, how, how unlikely does something have to be before we have enough evidence to, to support all, our alternative hypothesis? Oh my gosh alternative hypothesis over our null hypothesis. And I'm going to get into that in a second with statistical significance, okay? But here's a, just a quick summary for you, okay, uh, of, of how we use p-value, okay? So if you get a very small p-value, that is sufficient evidence against H O, okay. So against your null hypothesis, okay. Hold on, give me one sec, y'all. Let me pause this briefly, uh, so I can figure out something with my text. Hold on, one second. There we go. Sorry about that, folks. My my subscript was not working for a moment. Okay. So 
small p-value is evidence against your null hypothesis, okay? What a small p-value mean, p means is your observed value is unlikely to occur when your null hypothesis, h sub 0, is true, okay? And the result, right, uh, the decision that we make based on a small p-value is we reject our null hypothesis in favor of our alternative hypothesis, okay? And then a large p-value is essentially the opposite, right? But rather than saying we have evidence to support the null, what we say when we have a larger p-value is that we fail to give evidence against the null, okay? Which is a, a slightly tricky, uh, like, theoretical concept, right? Um, but essentially what we're saying is that the observed value is reasonably likely to occur when the null hypothesis is true, okay? And the result, what we do, is we fail to reject the null, okay? You never accept the null. Never, 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 okay? Because when you run a hypothesis test, uh, with a particular statistic value, okay? Just because that hypothesis test did not provide us enough evidence to reject the null, that doesn't mean that we couldn't get another sample with a different statistic that would reject the null, right? Would lead us to rejecting our original claim. Okay, so we're kind of being like petty spaghetti over here as statisticians. We're, we're never going to say like, oh, you're right. I'm just saying I don't have enough evidence to prove that you're wrong. I'm not saying you're right. I just don't have enough evidence maybe yet to prove that you are wrong. Okay, so the key thing here is the language, right? So you're either going to reject the null right? Your decision would either be to reject the null or fail to reject the null. Okay? You're never going to accept the null, okay? Be petty spaghetti, right? Okay, very similar to confidence level, confidence intervals, right? Uh, and thinking even all the way back to what we did in unit four with the linear regression, right? There is an interpretation of p-value, okay? And there's a little word formula for you to follow. So here's your interpretation, your word formula, okay? So you say, assuming, uh, and then you would type uh, or write whatever your null hypothesis is in context. So assuming the null in context is true, there is a p-value, right? So you would write your p-value, your probability. There's a p-value, probability, of getting a sample, and then you would write either mean or proportion, right? And remember, in this unit, we're dealing with proportions of, right? And then you put your sample statistic. So either your sample mean or your sample proportion like the actual number, by chance in a random sample. Okay, so the what you're seeing me underline here is what you would have to fill in, right, depending on the context of the problem. Okay, all right, so the last thing I want to talk to you about before I show you an example, 
is this idea of statistical significance, right? So this gets to the idea of the number, right? Well, how small does my p-value have to be before I can reject my null, okay? How small does this value have to be, okay? So just as a reminder, based on the evidence from your hypothesis, you'll either reject the null and, ex and accept your alternative hypothesis, you're gonna go with that alternative hypothesis instead, or you're gonna fail to reject the null, okay? So the answer to the question, like at what point is my p-value small enough, depends on you as the statistician, it depends on the context of the problem. So there's really no like one and done rule about how small the p-value has to be before you reject the null. Okay, um, but we do compare our p-value, whatever we get, right? In any hypothesis test, you compare your p-value with some established cutoff value, okay? And that cutoff value is called your significance value. Okay, or your significance level. Okay. So the symbol that we use for your significance, uh, your significance level is the Greek letter alpha. Okay. The kind of neat thing about statistical significance is that you as the statistician get to choose your significance level. Okay, and I'm actually going to change this and say not significance value, but we'll just call it a significance level because that's the most common term for it. Okay. Um, very similar to confidence level when you do a confidence interval. You as the statistician get to choose your confidence level, okay? In a similar way, you as the statistician, before you run the test, get to choose your cutoff value, okay? Uh, the most common significance level, the most common value for alpha is 0 0.05, okay? So that's our typical cutoff value, right? Um, so around 5%. Right, a 5% probability or lower. So if we get a result, right, a statistic, when we run a sample, right, and we gather all our data and we figure out what this sample value is, if that sample value would occur 5% of the time or less, right, then typically we say that is sufficient enough evidence to reject your null. OK, so the goal of our statistical significance here is to give you a cutoff value so that you can quantify the phrase not likely to occur. OK, um, and we've talked about statistical significance before in like a very broad sense of the term. Right. But I've never given you a given you an actual definition for it. Right. So when we say something is statistically significant, Right, we are saying it's not likely to happen just by random chance, right? And this alpha value, this significance level, will give you an exact value for the term not likely, an exact cutoff value, right? You'll often hear me uh, comparing it to like dating standards, right? Like most people, <laughs> When they like decide they're going to go on a date with somebody, they have like, you have like a standard that that person typically has to meet, right? Uh, and most people are not willing to date anyone who's below their standards, right? So if there is someone who like, wants to date you that is like you see them as below your standards right you might reject that person right but if they're not below your standards right then you would like consider going out on a date with them right very similar to what happens with your p-value okay so if your p-value is less than your cutoff value they are below your standards then you're going to reject your null 
okay? So that's what this is saying here. In general, a conclusion to a significance test will follow one of two paths, okay? Either your p-value is less than your significance level, okay? And if that is the case, you will reject the null. Okay. If your p-value is greater than or equal to your alpha value, you will fail to reject the null. Okay. Right. Because these phrases, reject or fail to reject the null, are the decisions that you have the ability to make as the statistician. Okay. All right. So with all of that information, right, all of that information in mind, okay, I want to walk you through an example problem, okay? So what we have kind of talked about in this video is the, the bare bones of like the beginning of a hypothesis test and the end of a hypothesis test, right? When you run a full hypothesis test, you usually have some setup at the beginning and then you do a little bit of math in the middle and then you end up with a conclusion at the end, okay? Very similar to a confidence interval. Right. When we did confidence intervals, you started with like checking your conditions uh, and doing some setup stuff. And then you had one step where you did all the math and then you put a conclusion at the end. Okay, hypothesis tests go through a very similar idea, right? So everything that I've talked about in this video is like the beginning of a hypothesis test, right? Setting up your hypotheses uh, and also the end of the hypothesis test, right? Once you do all the math to get your p-value, what you do after that, okay? So I'm going to do this problem for you as an example, right? And then I'm going to give you a chance to try one, okay? So... We have a study here from the National Institute of Health. They recommend a calcium intake of 1,300 milligrams of calcium per day for teenagers, okay? The, the National Board of, of Health, right, the National Institute of Health is concerned that te teenagers are not getting enough calcium, okay? Uh, and we wanna figure out, is that true or not? Okay, so researchers set up this hypothesis test. So they're saying the null hypothesis is that the true mean value of calcium consumed by teenagers is, in fact, 1,300 milligrams, right? So that's our status quo, right? That's our claim, okay? What we are trying to test for is, is that value actually less than 1,300 milligrams, right? And I got that from this phrase here that says they're concerned that teenagers are not getting enough calcium. Right. So we think they're actually consuming less than the recommended amount. OK, then they go through uh, and talk about the the test that they ran. So they asked a random sample of 20 teens to record their food and drink consumption for one day. Researchers computed their calcium intake right, uh, and figured out a sample mean of calcium intake. So their sample mean is 1,198 milligrams with a standard deviation of 411 milligrams. Okay? And then they said after checking that conditions were met, uh, researchers performed a significance test and got the p-value of 0.1404. Okay, so part A here asks, what does the null hypothesis mean in this setting? Okay, uh, so if the null hypothesis was true, then the true mean calcium intake for this population of teenagers is in fact 1300 milligrams per day. I.e., right, so to put that in layman's terms, teenagers actually are getting enough calcium. Okay, so that's what the null hypothesis means, right? And then our, our, our alternative hypothesis is saying, actually, we think teenagers might be getting less than that, right? That would be like what the alternative hypothesis means in this setting, okay? Part B says, interpret the p-value in context. So this is when you go up to your interpretation phrase right here, okay? So our, uh, our word formula here is assuming the 
and then you put your null hypothesis in context. Okay, so assuming the mean daily calcium intake in this teen population is actually 1300 milligrams, okay? There is a, and then you put your p-value next, 0 0.141 probability of getting a sample mean of 1,198 milligrams or less just by, by random chance in a random sample of 20 teens. Okay. It's usually a good idea when you're interpreting a p-value to put the to put the the sample right in there okay so obviously the sample value is less than 1300 milligrams right but we have to ask ourselves is it low enough to the point where we think the true value is actually not 1300 milligrams and we think it's actually lower than that right okay so part c says Okay, what conclusion would you reach if you set the significance level at 0 0.05? Okay, so the p-value was 0 0.141, and that's greater than 0 0.05. Okay, so what that means, right, the decision that I would make would be I'm going to fail to reject the null. Okay, so this, this p-value hasn't given me enough evidence to support my alternative hypothesis, right? P-value is greater than the significance level, so we're going to fail to reject the null. But we would reach a different conclusion if my significance level was 0.15, okay? So the p-value is, is still 0.141. But that's less than 0 0.15. So if I set my alpha value as 0.15, right, then I'm going to come to a completely different result. I'm going to make a different decision, right? Because the p-value is less than this significance level, I will reject the null. Okay. Now, again, you as a statistician get to choose this alpha value, right? So it's another balancing act that you have to strike, right? Because if you make your alpha value too high, then you're not going to be as convinced, right? People are not going to be as convinced by the results that you put out, right? Similar to how if you have a, a lower confidence level, right? People are not going to be as convinced by your results, right? But if you make your alpha value too small, like if I make my alpha value like 0 0.02 or 0 0.01, right, then it's going to be very, very difficult to achieve and get a sample that will actually be less than the p-value you set. So very similar to when we set confidence levels, we have to set our alpha values at like a, a middle ground, and typically that middle ground that we choose is 0.05 or 5%, okay? All right, so there's one more very similar to the one that we just did, one more problem very similar to the one we just did. So I would love for you to pause the video, try this one out on your own, okay? and then check back with me to see how you did. All right, folks, so let's go ahead and talk about this one and check your answers against mine. Okay, so in this problem, we have a company that's developing a new battery. It's supposed to last longer than the batteries that are currently on the market, okay? But these new batteries are much more expensive to produce, right? So rather than just going ahead with production, they wanna know and test these batteries out and say, do they actually last longer than the current batteries on the market? Okay, so based on their experience, the company knows that regular batteries last for 30 hours on average. So that's the, the claim, the status quo, the true value, okay? 
uh, company selects a simple random sample of 15 new batteries and uses them continuously until they die out. Their sample mean, uh, the lifetime of the battery in their sample mean was 33.9 hours. So larger, yes, but we want to say, see, is it, is that largeness, right, statistically significant, right? So they perform a significance test and they use the following hypotheses. So my null hypothesis is that the, the mean of these new batteries is the same as the old ones, equal to 30 hours, okay? But what we're trying to prove so that we can make the decision to put these new batteries on the market and go into production with them is we want to show with our significance test that the actual true mean of these batteries is greater than 30 hours, right? And mu in this case is the true mean lifetime of the new batteries, okay? And then, so they went through and they ran the significance test and they got that their p-value is 0.0729, okay? So in the context of this problem, the null hypothesis means this, okay? If the null hypothesis is true, then the true mean battery life of the new batteries, which is mu, okay, is equal to 30 hours. Okay. Interpreting the p-value in context, go straight back to your word formula. Assuming the mean battery life is 30 hours, right? so that's my context that I filled in, there is a 0.0729 probability of getting a sample mean of 33.9 hours or more just by random chance. And then they ask you, if you have these two different significance levels, what decision would you make? So if I set my significance level, my cutoff, my standard, my alpha value at 0.05, the p-value I got is greater than that. So that p-value does not provide sufficient evidence at that significance level for me to reject the null. So I'm going to fail to reject the null. Okay. Remember, you're never saying that you accept the null. You're always saying that you fail to reject it. Right? You're not saying that they are right. You're just not saying that you don't have enough evidence to prove that they are wrong okay? or that the claim is incorrect. Okay? We would reach a different conclusion, though, if we set the significance level at 0.15. Right? Um, so in that case, the p-value is less than our significance level. It's below our standard, right? Less than our cutoff, which means we are going to reject the null. All right. Okay. So that is the basics of hypothesis tests. It's actually a fair amount of the theory, right, behind hypothesis tests. And you'll see that when we get to the actual, like, step-by-step -step procedure, that what you've done in this video is, like, the first couple of steps as well as the last couple of steps. And all we're really missing is the math in the middle, right, in order to actually determine what this p-value is. Right? So that's what you're going to see not in the next video because the next one is about errors okay, and different types of errors you can make. But in the, the couple videos after that where I'm actually going to run some hypothesis tests for you. All right. So with that, I will see you all in the next video. Bye, everybody.